I want to share a message entitled, What Does It Mean to Be Saved? Now, if you've been around the church very long, you've probably heard that terminology. Maybe you've heard someone give a testimony that they were saved on such and such a day. Or maybe they've asked you a question, have you been saved or are you saved? And so sometimes we hear that word saved and we don't know really what it means. And actually in the English language, the word save is used in a lot of different contexts. And so therefore it can be a little bit confusing. Think about all the different contexts in which you hear the word save. People talk about saving time. They talk about saving money, saving face, maybe saving a document on a computer, or even a soccer player, a goalie, can make a save by blocking the ball and not allowing it to enter into the goal. And so the word save is used in a, little, a lot of different contexts and a lot of different ways in the English language. And yet I want to pose the question today, what does it mean to be saved? I'm using the word save in the idea that the Bible does, and that is to be rescued, to be delivered, and not just delivered from anything, to be delivered from the plight in which we find ourselves as fallen human beings and to be restored to God's favor. And so I want to talk about today, what does it mean to be saved? Now, maybe you already are saved and you know it. I hope this message will encourage you. I hope it will solidify your faith. I hope that at the end of this message that you will be praising God for saving you, that this is something you will never get over, that it's the greatest thing that's ever happened in your life. I know you've married a wonderful person. I know you may have a great job. I know you love your family, but let me tell you, the greatest thing that can happen to you in this life is that you meet Jesus Christ in a personal, life-transforming manner, that you've been saved. And I hope that you can rejoice over that. But maybe you're here today and you're not saved or you don't know if you're saved. I talk to people at times, they don't know if they're saved. They grew up in the church. Maybe they have a religious background. They read their Bible, they pray, but they're not sure if they're truly saved and in a right relationship with God. And I hope this message will help you too if you're in that particular situation. So our text for today is 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I'd like to read verses 12 through 17. This is basically Paul's testimony. We read about Paul's testimony in the book of Acts. It's shared like three times in the book of Acts, his Damascus Road experience. But he also talks about it in some of his letters, and one of those instances is found here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, where you have Paul's testimony of salvation. So let's begin in verse 12. Paul says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant, or we might translate that, a violent man. But I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now he ends with this doxology. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, that's Paul's testimony. And I believe in his testimony, we can learn what does it mean to be saved. And so I'm going to talk about that today. And I want to talk about and I want to look at what are we saved from, what are we saved by, and what are we saved for. That's what I want to discuss this morning 
Let's begin by talking about what are we saved from. We are saved from sin. Again, I know the the English word save is used in a lot of different contexts, saving money, saving time, saving face. But I'm using it like the Bible uses it, to deliver, to rescue. And we have been rescued from our sin. Paul talks about this. If you notice in verse 13, he says, I was formally, by the way, don't miss that word, formally. This is who I used to be, but I'm no longer that person. Let me tell you, when you're truly saved, it makes a difference in your life. He says, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant or violent man. Paul begins his testimony by acknowledging who he used to be, by acknowledging his sin. And I want to say to you today, if you're going to be saved and enter into a personal relationship with God, you have to acknowledge your sin. You can't deny it any longer. You can't rationalize it. We live in a culture that rationalizes sin. We call it by different names. We make excuses for it. And yet Paul comes clean and says, this is who I used to be, and we have to come clean with God. If we try to cover our sin and hide our sin, we will never be saved. It begins with the confession of our sin. Not you confessing someone else's sins, but confessing your own sins. That's what Paul does. And he describes himself as a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. He says, I used to be a blasphemer. You say, well, how did Paul blaspheme God? Well, to blaspheme is to speak negatively about, to speak ill of. How did he speak ill of God? By denying that Jesus was the Son of God. He denied that Jesus was the Son of God. He spoke against Jesus. He said he is not the Christ. He is not truly the Son of God. And he spoke against his followers. And in that way, he blasphemed God. If you deny that Jesus is the Son of God, you are blaspheming because he truly is the Son of God. And then he persecuted who? The church. He went out and he had Christians arrested. He had them tried. He had them killed. You remember Stephen, the first Christian martyr? He stood there witnessing that, giving his approval to Stephen being martyred for the faith. He persecuted the church. He was against Jesus Christ and against the body of Christ. And then he says he was an arrogant man. I think a better translation, he was a violent man. We see this. If you go back and you read a verse like Acts chapter 8, verse 3, it says he ravaged the church. He would drag people out of their houses to take them, to arrest them. He was a violent man. Now, here's what I find very, very interesting. There was no one more sincere and more religious than than Paul before he became a Christian. He was deeply religious, and he was deeply sincere. Everything he did, he thought he was doing in order to please Almighty God. He was very religious. He was a Pharisee. He kept the law of God the best that he knew how. He didn't think he was blaspheming. He didn't think he was doing wrong. That's why he says, I did it in ignorance. There was no one more religious or more sincere than Paul in his day, and yet he wasn't saved. And he wasn't right with God. I'm going to tell you, there's a message in that right there. We want to say, well, as long as you're sincere, as long as you're religious, everything's going to be okay. God just accepts everyone that's religious, accepts everyone that's sincere. Let me tell you, Paul was very, very religious. Paul was incredibly sincere, and yet he was opposing God. He said, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, and I was an arrogant man. But then he met Jesus, or rather Jesus met him, and he was saved. He was saved from sin. We are saved from the consequences of sin, but we are also saved from the control of sin. Not just the consequences, 
The consequences of sin is death, eternal separation from God. We're saved from the consequences, but we're also saved from the control of sin. Again, I go back to how Paul shares his testimony. He says, I was formerly this, but I'm not this any longer. The power of sin is broken in our life at salvation. The power of sin is broken. Charles Wesley said, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the phallus clean. His blood availed for me. He can break the power of canceled sin. Now, some people, they go to this passage and they read a verse like verse 15 that says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And they say, see, it's present tense. He says, I am the worst. Paul is admitting that he's still a horrible sinner even though he's a Christian. I think they've misunderstood this passage. He says, formerly, the sin he's talking about is blaspheming. The sin he's talking about is persecution. The sin he's talking about is the violent, arrogant man he was. And he says, I used to be that man. I'm not that man anymore. So why is he using the present tense? Is he saying I'm just as bad a sinner now as I was before I was a Christian? No. I like how I, I Howard Marshall interprets this. He's just talking about his continued unworthiness of the grace of God. Throughout his life, he is continually unworthy of the grace of God because of all that he's done in the past, all the sins that he's committed against God. He just remains in an unworthy state. I hope you feel that today. Maybe you've been a Christian for 50 years. Maybe you, it's hard to even remember what it was like when you weren't a Christian. I hope you still feel deeply unworthy of the grace of God that you know that you haven't earned salvation. You don't deserve salvation. You can't pat yourself on the back because you saved yourself. You didn't save yourself. Jesus saved you. The present tense is not used because Paul is saying, hey, I'm just as bad a sinner now as I used to be. No, he's been transformed. You say, well, am I a sinner even though I'm a Christian? I think you're a saint. That's what the Bible says. Go and read the Bible. When Paul would write to the Christians in Ephesus, in Colossae, or wherever, he never said to the sinners in Ephesus. He said to the saints in Ephesus. Their title, their designation was a saint. Now, I'm not saying we're sinless. I actually think there are three categories, right? So it's not just, hey, I'm a, I'm a sinner, it's not that I'm sinless, I'm a saint. I'm not a sinner. A sinner is one who sins all the time and one who doesn't repent of their sin and doesn't even feel compunction for their sin. That's their lifestyle. I am a sinner. I'm just sinning all the time. That's my lifestyle. I don't even care that I'm sinning. I don't repent. That's not a believer. You're not a sinner if you've been converted by the power of Jesus Christ. That's not your lifestyle anymore. But I'm not sinless either. I'm a saint. I've been set apart by God, for God, and when I fall short, I ask him to forgive me, and he does, and I just keep living for the Lord. I'm not sinless, but I'm not a perpetual sinner either. I'm a saint. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. I hope that you experience that. And if you're just living a life of perpetual sin and you're not repenting and you don't feel sorry for your sin, I remember talking to a, a president of a university, very godly man. His name was Dennis Kinlaw. He had been the president of Asbury College. And I was talking to him about holiness because if you're ever around a holiness church, you can get the idea that God expects us to be sinless in this life. And it can be very overwhelming. Because you know that you're not sinless 
And sometimes the pastor can make you think you have to be sinless to be a Christian. And I remember talking to Dr. Kinlaw about this. He was a very holy man, very intelligent man, a very biblically based man. And he said, Mark, it's not about being sinless, but it's about being sensitized to when you fall short. And he said, if you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again, but it does mean that when you do fall short, you recognize it and you repent of it. That's the difference. You're sensitized. Not that you're never going to fall short, but when you do, you realize it. You feel bad about it, and you ask God to forgive you. We are saved from sin. Well, second, we are saved by faith. Verse 16, Paul says, as an example to those who would believe in him, that is in Jesus Christ, for eternal life. How are we saved? By faith. If you read the verses prior to this passage, Paul had been talking about the law. And I think there's a contrast here. We're not saved by the law. We're saved by faith. We're not saved by good works. We're saved by faith. We're not saved by morality. We're saved by faith. We're not saved by our feelings. We're saved by faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may say, well, what is faith? Well, verse 14 says it's a gift of God. You ever thought about faith in that way? Faith is a gift from God. Now, God won't make you believe, and he won't believe for you, but you cannot believe without the prevenient grace of God. Can I say that again? God won't make you believe. He won't believe for you. You've got to do the believing, but you cannot believe without the prevenient grace of God. The grace of God must be active in your life to give you the impetus and the desire and the understanding to be able to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who draws us. He is the one who awakens us. It's the prevenient grace of God. Here's how I would define faith. Faith is the God-given ability to rely on Christ alone for salvation. That's what faith is. It's the God-given ability to rely. We're not talking about just an intellectual assent. I have confessed the Apostles' Creed. No, it's more than that. It, it's relying, it's trusting leaning on we sang songs today about standing on the rock and the foundation we're talking about relying on something trusting in something faith is the god-given ability to rely on christ alone for salvation it is believing that christ died for our sins and his death is completely sufficient to atone for our sins and to reconcile us to god we are saved by faith. Now, faith is the means, but Christ is actually the one who saves us. That's why he says in verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. I love verse 15. I think verse 15 summarizes the story of Jesus. I think it summarizes the whole gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, some people think of Jesus as a moral teacher. Some think of him as a prophet. Some think of him as a miracle worker. But the Bible says he is principally a savior. He came into the world to save sinners. And how did he say him? Save him by dying on the cross, being resurrected on the third day. That's how he provided salvation. Look at Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That's another good summary of the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let me just ask you Is Jesus Christ your personal Savior? Have you confessed your sins? 
Have you asked him and invited him into your heart, into your life to forgive you, to reconcile you to God? Is Jesus Christ your personal Savior? You see, in verse 16, Paul says, my conversion is an example. Now, I want to clarify what he means by that. Verse 16, Paul says, my conversion is an example of the extraordinary patience of God. Let me tell you what he is saying and what he's not saying. What he is saying is, I'm an example in that if God could forgive me, he can forgive you. That's how he's an example. If God could forgive a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, a man that had Christians killed for their faith, basically a practicing murder, if God can forgive me, he can forgive you. And I don't think there's a sin that you've committed that you can't find in the Bible that God forgave that person of that sin. I don't care what it is, murder, adultery, idolatry, whatever it is. I don't think you can come up with a sin that's not found in the Bible that someone had committed and God forgave them of that sin. And so that's how his conversion is an example. He's saying, hey, if God can forgive me, he can forgive you. Now, let me tell you how it's not an example. He's not saying you have to have the same dramatic Damascus Road experience that I had. And some people get this confused. And they see how someone got saved, and they think that all the elements have to be the same. They don't. I can't tell you how many people I've prayed with to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they've all been different. I have prayed with people before who have been sobbing uncontrollably. That as I'm trying to minister to them and pray with them and pray for them, that they are so deeply under conviction that they are sobbing uncontrollably, and I can hardly even communicate with them. I've also prayed with people to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they never shed a tear. They're just not that emotional. But they were very sincere, and they meant business, and they prayed and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I prayed, prayed with people at that altar. I prayed with people at this altar. I prayed with people all these altars down through the years. I prayed with people in the pews. I prayed with people in my office. I prayed with people in hospitals and nursing homes. It, it's not, well, it has to be at the altar. It has to be in a church service. Paul's, Paul's example is, if God can forgive me, he can forgive you. Paul's example is not that you have to be saved in just the same way that he was. You may not have a burning bush experience. You may not have a Damascus Road experience. You may not see a blinding light. And sometimes people, this is why they doubt their salvation. Now, I want you to listen to me very clearly. Some people doubt their salvation not because they're not saved, but because they didn't have the same experience as someone else. And someone's experience was very emotional and very dramatic and very Paul-like, Damascus Road-like, and you didn't have that same experience when you came to Christ, and you think, well, then I'm not saved. No. Let me tell you the one essential element. It's not tears. It's not whether or not you're at an altar. It's not if it's in a church service or revival camp meeting. The one essential is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one essential. And even today you might say, well, pastor, I don't know if I was really saved back then. I was so young. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ right now? Don't worry about what happened when you were 8, 9, 10, or 11. By the way, if, even if you had real faith then and you don't have faith, real faith now, you're not saved. It's not about just having faith at one time in your life. It's about sustaining that faith throughout your life. So don't worry about what happened in the past. Do you trust and rely on Jesus Christ alone right now? And if you do, you're saved. That's how... Paul is an example. Faith is essential. You have to believe. We're not saved by good works. We're saved by faith. 
Well, one last thing. We've talked about what we're saved from. We're saved from sin. Let me talk about what we're saved for. We're saved for ministry. Verse 12, Paul says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he has considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. So we are saved from sin and we are saved for ministry. We are saved to serve the Lord. Not just to say, hey, I'm saved from sin. Okay, yes, that's great. You've been saved from sin. Now you're saved to serve the Lord. Here at Town Church, we talk about the three S's. I got this from Chuck Lawless years ago, a book he wrote, Membership Matters, the three S's. And this is something we want for everyone in the church. We want you to be a part of the three S's. I want to give them to you right now. Sunday worship, a small group, and a place of service. These are the three S's that we want you, every one of you. I'm not talking about just some of you, every single one of you. And if you want to make your pastor proud, then you check off all the three S's. Sunday worship. We gather every Sunday morning, we worship the Lord. Didn't you enjoy our worship today? You say, wasn't that a great time of worship? Hey, we're still worshiping right now. Worship is the music, but worship is also the praying and worship is also the preaching and worship is also the responding and the worship is also going out and living your life for the Lord. But we gather every Sunday in the name of Jesus Christ. Is that a priority in your life? Sunday worship. Or is it, well, I'll just come when I feel like it or... I'll come every now and then. It should be a priority. If you can't say amen, say I'm the man real fast. And people around you will think you're saying amen. It needs to be a priority. Sunday worship. Also a small group. Small group is a place where you have fellowship, accountability. You get to know people. We have a lot of small groups in our church, all ages. All kinds of groups. Find a small group. You'll be blessed. And then a place of service. We are saved for ministry. What is your gift? What is your talent? Pastor Kyle preached about this a few weeks ago, serving. And many of you signed up and said, hey, I want to serve in this way or that way. But some of you didn't sign up. We want you to serve the Lord. You have gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given you that he wants you to use in this local fellowship, but we don't know what they are. You know what they are. God knows what they are. We want you to use your gifts and talents to serve the Lord. You know, years ago, I went to Israel, and I lived there for about three and a half months, and on one occasion, I went to the Dead Sea and actually went out into the Dead Sea. You don't need floaties. You don't know, need anything because you just, I mean, the Dead Sea is almost like sitting in jello. And the Dead Sea is dead. There are no living organisms in the Dead Sea. You see, you have the Sea of Galilee up in the north, and flowing out of the Sea of Galilee is you have the Jordan River, and the Jordan River flows right into the Dead Sea. Boom, it stops. There's no outlet. It just takes in and takes in. And it never gives out. And it's called the Dead Sea because there's no living organisms in the Dead Sea. You're not going to go fishing in the Dead Sea. It's dead. I think the Christian life is like that. If you're not careful, you can be like the Dead Sea. Just taken in. Taken in. How many of you have heard message after message after message, sermon after sermon after sermon, worship service after worship service after worship service? Are you giving back to the Lord, finding your place of service? I've read through the Bible many, many times, and I've never found a spiritual gift called pew sitting. Never found that in the Bible. You need to get off the pew and get active in serving the Lord. You say, well, I don't know what my gifts or talents are. Ask God to show you. 
Ask someone who knows you. Say, what do you think it is? And if you still don't know, set up an appointment with one of the pastoral staff, and I guarantee you we will find a place of service for you. You will love the church more, and you will get more out of the church if you find your place of service. The old cliche is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work in the church. I've heard it for years. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. How many of you have ever heard this saying before? 20% of the people do 80% of the work in the church. I would love someday to be a part of the church, a church where 100% of the people do 100% of the work of the church. Everyone is mobilized and serving God. So you were saved from sin, saved by faith, but you were saved for ministry. Have you found your place of service? Now listen, Paul ends with a doxology. I want to read it again, and this is how I want to end as well before we have a a song of invitation, song of praise. Verse 17, after sharing his testimony, what do you do after you share a testimony? Paul says, the only thing I know to do is praise God. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What does he say? God is a king whose reign will never end. God is a king who cannot die. A king whose splendor is so great we cannot see him until we ourselves are glorified. A king who is the only God and a king who is worthy of eternal honor and glory. Let's praise our king. Let's give him glory for salvation and transformation in our life.